often imitated, often duplicated, often mentioned, often misunderstood, always exclusive, and never following someone else's lead. That's supreme. Hey, before we dive in, we're letting you know that this video is brought to you by us. We ain't selling out anytime soon, so if you want to help support us making dope content on our own, donate to our Patreon. If you're feeling us, subscribe, like, share, and comment. Thanks. Enough of that, now let's get into it. When was the first time you were exposed to Supreme? Was it by seeing a box logo hat on a hype beast nerd? A t-shirt on a Kardashian clone? Did you discover them on Tumblr? Did you wait in line for the elephant dunks? Were you there since the Raekwon shirt? Are you an OG that spotted Jason Dill's hoodie in photosynthesis, the laptop sticker in Hackers? Do you go back, way back? Supreme was founded in 1994 in the Soho neighborhood of Manhattan, New York City. The man behind it all was James Jebbia, the American-born British expat came to New York in the early 80s and worked at a small, trendy boutique named Parachute. This was a different time, a different vibe. The Lower East Side was grungy, rent was affordable, drugs were plentiful, and everyone was in the mix. This was a wild, untamed NYC. While learning the ins and outs of retail, Jebbia would eventually link up with a key mentor, Sean Stuzzi. Stuzzi ran his eponymous brand as a higher-end approach to California surfwear. James Jebbia would go on to work at Stuzzi's Soho shop and eventually open his own boutique, Union. While working at Union and Stuzzi, Jebbia began to notice a new, upcoming youth culture of NYC skate rats, graffiti writers, and street kids. They had unique styles and personalities, and no one was really targeting them as a fan base. Jebbia set aside $12,000 to set up an experimental skate shop on 274 Lafayette Street, a store that would stock specific brands that street skaters were into, nothing flashy or commercialized. He hired local skaters to be the store's staff and left the doors wide open during the day. If you were cool with the crew, you could come in, drink 40s, lounge around, and shoot the breeze with the cool kids. You didn't even have to buy anything. James Jebbia named this space after the 1964 John Coltrane album, A Love Supreme. The first logo was inspired by designer Andre Kurej, and the now infamous box logo was an homage to the conceptual artist Barbara Kruger. There's a tremendous amount of layers in the concept of Supreme, and we'll dive deeper into that in part two. Before Supreme was anything, it was a downtown meetup spot. Whether it was daytime chillin' or nighttime parties, Supreme was the place where little punk kids, rich or poor, could be themselves. Even though Jebbia was the owner, Supreme was truly possessed by the small, misfit community that populated it. The skaters would decide who could buy, who can't come, and what merch would be in stock. They represented a specific subculture of skateboarding, quintessential to New York. Supreme's legitimacy continued to grow on the underground. Friends and family were cast in Larry Clark's Kids. The film was such a definitive snapshot of the Supreme lifestyle, it could have been a documentary. The Supreme crew was growing, and they were all young legends in the making. Many industry heavyweights and brands spent their formative years at Supreme. Eddie Cruz of Undefeated, Jason Dill and F***ing Awesome. Zoo York's Harold Hunter, Reel's Mark Gonzalez, Dave Ortiz of DQM, Aaron Bondaroff of A New York Thing, Chloe Seventy, All Timers, Acapulco Gold, Ear Snot and Dash Snow of Iraq, Keith Huffnagel and Huff, Chico Brenes, Bill Strobeck, Ryan McGinley, Harmony Corinne, Vashti Cola, and numerous others were coming up during Supreme's quiet rise. Before Supreme was a coveted brand from Instagram to Iowa, the shop would first resonate mostly with the youth of a different urban jungle, Tokyo. 
In the mid and late 90s, Supreme was strictly East Coast. Sure, it was on the radar of skaters like Eric Costin, but outside of NYC, Supreme remained a private function for years. The first major breakout that Supreme would see would be its embrace in Tokyo. 90s street culture in Japan was extremely nuanced and specific. It's only natural that Supreme was influential in Ginza, Aoyama, Harajuku, and all the other hip neighborhoods of Tokyo. Budding Japanese influencers like Fujiwara Hiroshi and Nigo were huge fans of Stuzi. By osmosis, Supreme fell into the mix. The reception and demand of the Japanese youth was so powerful that Supreme opened several of its boutiques in Tokyo. By gaining the legitimacy, fandom, and validation of Japan, Supreme was poised to be THE elevated street icon of the early 90s. Running alongside ultra-popular brands Stussy, A Bathing Ape, and the early days of Nike SB, Supreme slowly became a staple of the early 2000s urban youth culture. Although the influence of Supreme would grow, James Jebbia continued to stay at the core of the brand's philosophy. Always keep the street kids in the driver's seat. Supreme was turning into something magnificent. Every move they made was just the right mix of wild and meticulous. The boutiques were beautiful and minimalist and had a museum-like quality. The clothing collections of each season were phenomenally considerate of the city that shaped them. Mob Deep Hennessy jerseys, Zoo York decks, Dipset and Lou Reed shirts, and attire that could have been part of the wardrobe in a Scorsese movie. The collaborations were not only breaking the mold of what a skate brand could do, but they were breaking out of every mold invented. They mixed it up and flipped it on its head, and it was all because of one thing the love of New York skateboarding. Unfortunately, there's legions of Supreme fans out there that do not understand this. Supreme is defined by these two titles, a boutique skate shop and a skateboard lifestyle brand. That's it. That's absolutely it. Supreme is not a streetwear clothing company. Those sneaker lines? The Supreme lines now. Supreme's got a whole thing with Supreme. lines. Supreme. What is like, Supreme? Exactly. It's a brand. It's a streetwear brand. <clears throat> I don't understand. Like, why is everybody buying this? It's like, limited. Limited quantities of whatnot. And... Supreme is not a hype beast accessory company. Supreme isn't about hopping on trends and being embraced by influencers. They don't make stuff to be cool. It's the other way around. They've been cool, and they make stuff. Everything they make is about skateboarding, New York, modern art, and the characters that live and breathe the above. One artsy startup skate brand that deserves some shine is Miss. With graphics inspired from antique color engraved prints, Miss truly brings something new to the table. Check them out and push in a different direction. Unless you're in the know, Supreme does not offer any explanations to outsiders. Although this helps increase the mystery and conviction of the brand, it's also led to a terrible side effect. People have adopted Supreme to give themselves undeserved cool points. Everybody wants these headbands. They're like $32 headbands. They flip for like a buck, buck 20. You know, this thing's sick, man. This is a serious jacket. That's Retail, sick. it's a $700 coat. It's a beautiful coat. I sold Seven. this jacket for 1200. Oh, it's already gone. Yeah, that's why I bought it. They believe that their ability to purchase and flaunt Supreme merch automatically makes them an aesthetic pioneer. The rarity and exclusivity of many Supreme items create a demand so strong that the secondary resale market has often spiraled out of control. With James Jebbia and crew keeping within their own bubble, the image of Supreme, unfortunately, is often handled by the people most disconnected from it. There's been complaints of Supreme products being overpriced and worthless, and this is because many of the items are being obtained through resale, where the prices have been set by the demand, and not the actual intended price. This leads to spectators being confused about why a box logo shirt costs $100, or why people should shell out for a branded crowbar or a brick. 
Look at this. Supreme the Crowbar. They sell a crowbar. Yeah, so the crowbar would just have like the name Supreme on it. We have to look into the brand a little bit to understand it, but it's, it's sort of part of the joke almost. They're making parody of the craziness of it all by just throwing their brand name on stuff. This cycle of confusion grows exponentially as uninformed crowds spout on about theories of a Supreme that trolls and tricks the masses to buy useless objects. The meaning of each Supreme piece gets lost every time someone buys it for clout instead of appreciation. James Jebbia's attempt to add meaning to the skate culture he embraced follows a similar philosophy of another artist, Marcel Duchamp. Frequently associated with the Surrealist and Dada movements, Duchamp sought to challenge common definitions of art. He worked for mental stimulation over visual stimulation. His paintings sought to capture fluid moments and his ready-made objects were designed to provoke conversations on importance and meaning. This practice is the very method that James Jebbia uses to fuel the heart and soul of Supreme. Supreme's ability to create art objects as references to the grimy NY streets of yesteryear is second to none. But you have to know and love those times to really value Supreme. You gotta love Grave Diggers, Slappy Grinds, Boostin, MoMA, and Hoppin' Turnstiles. The store that catered to those days wound up assisting in building streetwear as we know it. Sneaker culture flourished from the ideas of Eddie Cruz. High-end boutique skate brands reached new heights with Huff. Rogue gorilla brands like Fucking Awesome carried the spirit of ratty, stylish NYC skate life. Items were produced in limited amount because they were made for the individual. Supreme pulled in famous supporters alongside with unknown kids because that's what Soho was all about. And presently, for better or worse, Supreme is becoming a hipster status symbol. We'll touch more on that in part two of this series. Let's just focus on the positives for now. How did Supreme go from being a tiny retail experiment into one of the most impactful brands of the 21st century? It's an easy plan to start and a difficult one to commit to. One, recognize purity. Supreme would be nothing if it wasn't for Jebbia's commitment to respecting his original neighborhood scene. Find the pulse of your own city and harness the energy. Two, elevate the culture. Supreme truly values 90s NYC. When it came time to represent, they treated the store like a museum. Three, have bigger inspirations. Supreme never once tried to be like another brand. They try to be like an era. There's a reason why Supreme has been able to reach its current level of influence and popularity. It has nothing to do with hype or clever marketing. Supreme was as real as it gets. When you join a movement and dedicate yourself to it, your brand becomes legendary. That's what it means to push product. Twisted it, look toward it so big head of my dreams and all my start time the charm like rigor mortis. When I walk into a room, no I'm probably on some clouds. I ain't even talking, but they say complaining.